My name is Ryan Spitler, and I'm going to talk about linear representations and finite quotients. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, and second, I would like to acknowledge that most of the new results, the new results, new-ish at least results that I'm talking about here are all mostly joint with Ben McReynolds. Um, there's some other joint work with other people, but that will be separately acknowledged. So let's get started. Uh, the first thing that we'll say is uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to assume that, that all the groups that I'm discussing are finitely generated and residually finite. So that assumption will be implicit in a bunch of statements of theorems and things. And uh, and so, yeah, if you forget about that assumption, some of the statements might not be true. So, so keep that in mind at times. So all groups are finitely generated and residually finite. And I want to start out the whole discussion by uh, recalling a certain result that that me and some collaborators recent, well, somewhat recently proved, um, which is that for certain, a couple of particular groups, so for gamma, uh, so uh, I should say that the collaborators were uh, Martin Brideson, Ben McReynolds again, Alan Reed, and then myself, and, and it was published in 2021. So for this group gamma, which is PSL2 Z adjoint omega, which where omega is a third root of unity and um, Z adjoint omega is the ring of integers for that for the number field associated here. So for that group or for gamma, which is the, is the fundamental group of the weeks manifold, which is the smallest volume closed hyperbolic three manifold. For these two groups, uh, gamma is profinitely rigid. So I discussed this a little bit in my background material, but in, in a few words, that means that gamma is completely determined among finitely generated residually finite groups by its collection of finite quotients. So, um, so the finite quotients of gamma completely determine gamma up to, um, up to isomorphism. Uh, so what should I say about these groups that's relevant for some of the com coming discuss discussion? Each of these groups are the fundamental groups of finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds or orbifolds. So this, this second one here is the fundamental group of a manifold, while this one is actually the fundamental group of an orbifold. So there is some torsion in this group. So... Uh, finite volume, this manifold is closed while this one is actually just finite volume, it has a cusp. So, so what does that mean? They are each hyperbolic, so that means that each of these groups lives inside PSL2C. It has a particular representation into PSL2C, the discrete faithful representation. Um, and this, P this representation into PSL2C sort of relies on the fact that PSL2C is isomorphic to the orientation preserving isometry group of H3, the hyperbolic three space. So, um, so these particular groups, they're abstract groups, they're, they're each finitely presented, um, but so from this geometric character of them as fundamental groups of geometric manifolds, they also have a particular representation into PSL2C. Um, okay, so we showed that these groups are profinitely rigid and all right, what's the rough idea for how that went about? And, and this will motivate the, the results that are coming. So, so how would one show that these groups are profinitely rigid? Roughly, how did we do it? So the first major step was that we showed that the profinite completion of these groups, which again is sort of a package which contains all of the information of the finite quotients for these groups, essentially that the finite quotients of gamma can detect uh, this particular representation. Each of these groups comes with a special representation to PSL2C. And, um, and what we were able to show is for these particular groups, the profinite completion, the, the collection of finite quotients was able to sort of detect this representation. So there were some, and, and the detection, you'll be able to see uh, what exact, why exactly it's in scare quotes once we get to some of the later statements of theorems, because it's, it's a sort of rough detection in general, and it's only for these very special examples where it, it really almost detects the representation exactly. Um, 
So for these particular examples that I mentioned in the, in the theorem, we need to make a lot of strong assumptions on the groups. So these particular groups only, essentially the only representations that the, these groups have into PSL2C is the discrete faithful one. Okay, you could conjugate this representation. You can actually take a Galois automorphism of, of the field, the, the number field that's going on there, but otherwise that's all the representations. And also these groups are arithmetic, they're arithmetic uh, groups, they can be defined using sort of arithmetic information, which I guess I won't really get into too much today. But the type of arithmetic information that they're allowed to have is very, very constrained. So these are very particular manifolds that we're able to get this, this first thing to, to work on. Um, but what is the consequence of being able to detect the representation? What we're able to show is that any other group lambda, again, finitely generated and residually finite, any other group lambda with the same profinite completion as gamma actually has a representation or a, a homomorphism at least from lambda to gamma uh, as a subgroup of PSL2C. So because lambda has the same profinite completion as as gamma and gamma gamma hat, the, the finite quotients of gamma can detect this representation, we're actually able to produce a special representation for lambda. And it lives as a subgroup of gamma. So this gives us sort of very direct connection between lambda and gamma that doesn't come for free in general when you just have an isomorphism of profinite completions. Okay, so here we get a representation from, from step one, we detect representations and we get a map between the two groups. And then part two, uh, one can show that any big subgroups of gamma has extra finite quotients. What, what we're interested in here is what could possibly be the image of this homomorphism. F is taking lambda and it's mapping it onto some subgroup of, of gamma. And what could it be? From the construction, we know that it can't be trivial we know that the represent the image has to be Zariski dense. It can't be super super tiny inside PSL two C. Um, but what could it be? And using three manifold geometry, some special for these examples, the arguments were kind of ad hoc, a little bit uh, detailed. Um, but one eventually is able to show that if this lambda was not surjecting onto gamma, if it was on any proper subgroup. Uh, it would have extra quotients, which would be a contradiction. We know that the, the finite quotients of, of lambda and those of gamma are the same. So if lambda surjected something that was slightly smaller than gamma, it would get extra finite quotients, which isn't allowed. Uh, so what one is able to show is that F has to be surjective onto gamma. And one can use some like sort of standard arguments then to show that once that happens, this has to be an isomorphism. So this map from, from lambda to gamma that we constructed has to be an isomorphism. Therefore, these two groups are isomorphic. Okay, so, so that's a long-winded discussion perhaps of, of what had gone on in those previous, in that previous work. Um, there's two main steps, or at least the way I'm presenting it, it looks like there's two main steps. Uh, one is sort of trying to detect this representation and then the other is sort of distinguishing subgroups of this of, of gamma from gamma using finite quotients. And for part two, there's been some major, major progress that's been done since then. Uh, so for part two, if one wanted to do this now with the technology we have, there's a very nice result uh, now by Brideson and Reed that says if gamma is any finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds or orbifold group, um, then any big proper subgroup has extra finite quotients. So that's that's what I mean by big there again is any Zariski dense subgroup, any sort of large subgroup that's not just sort of teeny tiny inside. Uh, it will have finite extra finite quotients that gamma doesn't have. And so if you wanted to run the argument from two, uh, you could get this to work for any finite volume hyperbolic three manifold group. You don't have to do the sort of ticky tacky detailed arguments that were necessary at first. Um, and this follows in a, it uses in a very essential way, the, the really incredible work that, um, that's been produced by Yi Liu on these 
uh, profinite rigidity questions involving hyperbolic three manifolds among themselves. So like trying to detect if I have a hyperbolic three manifold, I have its collection of finite quotients, what can I say about which hyperbolic three manifold it is? And Liu was able to show that um, if you're looking just at finite volume hyperbolic three manifold groups, you can only have at most finitely many which have the same profinite completion. Um, and, and this was enough. This, this is very, very nice. And it was enough to show, uh, to give this result for, for Brideson and Reed. Um, okay, so in, in, in very broad terms, if you want to run this sort of idea of proving a group as profinitely rigid, uh, at least for a finite volume hyperbolic three manifold group, this part two is, is done. All the work has been done that you need there. Uh, so what about the first part, the detecting that representation? Um, what can we say about detecting representations of, of these groups more generally, not just in the very restrictive, um, with the very restrictive hypotheses that were necessary for these two groups? So, okay, so that's what my main result is about. And to set up the statement of that main result, I'll uh, give us a couple of, of definitions. So the first definition is that if we have a representation, uh, any representation now, uh, we'll call it phi from gamma to PSL2C, we'll say that this representation is rigid if every deformation of lambda comes from conjugation in PSL2C. So the idea here is if I have some particular representation to PSL2C, I could always conjugate this representation around with various um, matrices coming from PSL2C. And if I were to conjugate by something very, very small, very close to the identity, that would give me some other representation that's very small. Um, the idea here is that the only way I can sort of wiggle my representation is coming from this conjugation. So, so more explicitly for what that means is we can think about, okay, what if gamma is some two generated group? It's got two generators, X and Y, maybe some number of relators. Uh, what if this representation takes X to this two by two matrix? It takes Y to this other two by two matrix. Okay, that's our starting representation. Then what this rigidity um, hypothesis is saying is that if I have any other representation, maybe I'm calling it psi here, if psi is some other representation of gamma, which takes x very close to, uh, it takes x very close to where phi takes x, so that psi of x and phi of x are, are very close, and maybe we have like quote, scare quotes here for what exactly do I mean by close, and what, like how do you quantify these statements, but uh, that's the idea. If, if psi takes x very close to where phi does, and if psi takes y very close to where phi does, then, uh, then there's going to be some matrix in PSL2C which conjugates phi of G to, I'm sorry, psi of G to phi of G for every G. So this is some particular matrix which conjugates the whole representation of phi over to the representation of psi. Um, okay, so that's what a rigid representation is. Um, some important facts about rigid representations. Um, Zariski dense, at least rigid representations. Any any gamma has at most finitely many rigid representations in PSL2C up to conjugation. So uh, here you do need gamma to be finitely generated for this to really make to be to be the case. So this it's important that gamma is finitely generated here. And at most finitely many up to conjugation. That means if I have one rigid representation and I conjugate it over to another rigid represent another representation, it will still be rigid, but we usually think of those two representations as essentially being the same. So we, we count that whole conjugacy class of representations as being the same one. Uh, and once we take all of those, there's only finitely many. If we, if we consider the whole conjugacy class as being a single representation, then there's at most finitely many rigid representations. The other important thing to say about rigid representations is one can show that if you have uh, phi being some rigid representation, a priori all you know is that it's taking gamma into PSL2C, um, but if it's rigid, you know that actually the entries of, 
this of this representation, you can conjugate the representation, move it around a bit, and there will be there will be some conjugate of that representation that lands inside PSL2K for some number field. So you can move that, make that representation around so that all of the entries are algebraic numbers. And so they'll live in some finite extension of Q, some, some number field. At least up to conjugation, you may have to do some conjugating. So that's what a rigid representation is. The next thing I want to uh, define or talk about is the congruence completion of a like subgroup of, of PSL2C. And so for that, I'll, I'll think about a specific example first to sort of motivate the ideas involved. So our congruence completion example is, uh, is this group, which I'll call delta. And delta is PSL2Z adjoin one over three. So Z adjoin one over three, this is a ring. We can take uh, PSL2 over this ring and we'll get some collection of matrices that you'll be able to multiply them together. You'll get a group. Uh, so PSL2, Z, adjoin one over three. So this is a nice group, uh, delta. What can we say about delta? What, what can we do? How could we get some finite quotients? We're interested in finite quotients. So how can we get some, some finite quotients going here? So what we can do is because PS, this delta it lives as sort of matrices, with entries in some ring, we can mod out the matrix entries, the matrix coefficients by, by uh, like ideals or something and get, and get a, a homomorphism to a finite group. So if P is not equal to three here, we, we've adjoined one third. So that, that three is special, but for P anything other than three, we get a homomorphism from Delta onto PSL2 Z mod P. Uh, one way you can think about that is, okay, certainly Z maps to Z mod P. We know how to reduce entries mod P when you're in Z. The other one is that one third, as long as P isn't equal to three, three will be invertible in Z mod P. So there will be some entry or there will be some, uh, some number in Z mod P, uh, which is the inverse of three. And if you map one third to that number, you get a well-defined homomorphism from Z adjoin one over three to ZP. And so if you just apply that homomorphism to each coefficient of the matrices here, you'll get a map from Delta to PSL2 Z mod P. Okay, and it will be surjective and everything will be nice. So, so that is how you get a finite quotient or well, in this case, a bunch of finite quotients coming from varying P. What you can also do is you can, instead of taking PSL to Z mod P, you could take mod P squared, mod P to the third, mod P to the fourth, take the whole collection of all of those. And what you'll get in fact is a homomorphism from uh, Delta to PSL to Z P, which is for me, the P adic integers. So you'll get this sort of P adic representation of Delta P into PSL to Z adjoin P. I'm sorry, Z, uh, Z, P, the P adic integers. <clears throat> okay, so that's for all of the P that aren't three. What happens for P equals three? Well, for P equals three, you can't really reduce mod P. If you wanted a homomorphism to PSL2 Z mod three, there's no way to, there's nowhere to send one third because three is not invertible mod three. Uh, okay, so, so that doesn't really work at this step, but what can you do? is you can send Z adjoin one third to the three attic numbers. So uh, if you take Z three, the, the three attic, the three attic integers and you adjoin a third, you'll get Q three, the three attic field, the three attic numbers. And there you do get a, a homomorphism. So including Z adjoin one over three into the three attic field gives you this homomorphism from Delta to PSL two Q three. And this is another p adic representation. But what's the difference between these two p adic representations? Well, here delta lands in PSL2 ZP. ZP is a profinite ring. This PSL2 ZP, this is a profinite group. It's a compact topological group. It's a compact group. It's small. It has small image in, in this representation. This PSL2 Q3, it is not, the, the image of delta here is not compact. This PSL2 Q3, this is a locally compact topological group which spreads out and the image of delta here is, is non-compact. It lives sort of everywhere. 
so the difference between the prime three and the prime p is uh, the difference between whether the image of delta is bounded and sort of has a compact closure, or if it's unbounded and spreads out everywhere. Okay, so, so we're really interested in finite quotients, and we only get these finite quotients uh, coming from these representations uh, for p not equal to three. So those are the ones we're interested in to form the congruence completion. So what do we do here? Uh, the thing that we want to do is we want to take the closure of delta uh, inside the direct product, maybe the uh, restricted direct product for those who know what's going on here. I'm sort of taking the adelic group um, here or the S adelic group, but with the adelic topology, but uh, everyone else just think that it's the direct product of PSL2 QP where the P is not equal to three. So that sort of Delta lives in the in a compact closure, some part that has compact closure in each of these factors. And we take the closure of Delta in this um, representation or this in this sub in this group. And what we get is that the closure of Delta, this is gonna be called the congruence completion and it's isomorphic to the product over all the P that aren't equal to three of PSL2 ZP. So this sort of takes all of those uh, representations of delta into p adic fields where the closure of delta is bounded, where it has compact closure, and it puts it into one package. Uh, and we call that, that one package delta bar, the congruence completion. Um, again, the thing to recall is that this delta bar is a profinite group. So there's a universal property for profinite completions, which implies that uh, delta hat, the full profinite completion, maps surjectively now onto uh, delta bar, the congruence completion. So what's going on here is that we have a certain collection of finite quotients of delta happening here, and there's all of the finite quotients of delta that are happening here. And this is sort of mapping between them. Okay, so that's one example. What's the general... Uh, definition then, now if we have delta being any subgroup of PSL2K for any number field, what we'll call the congruence completion of this delta is the closure of delta in, again, this direct product of a bunch of different p adic groups, but now there'll be PSL2KV, where V is not in S. And what we're going to do is we're going to let V range over all the finite places of K, finite places of K, and S is going to be the collection of those finite places where the image is unbounded, where the image sort of spreads everywhere rather than being constrained in some compact subgroup. And so this is what we'll call the congruence completion of delta. Uh, so a couple important things that are, are useful to know is that if you were to conjugate, here we're thinking of delta as being a subgroup of PSL2K, if you were to conjugate this representation around, especially with algebraic integers, it's it's easy to see that this congruence completion uh, doesn't change. If you, if you conjugate with some algebraic numbers, that's fine. It also works with transcendentals, but that's, uh, you know, not something we have to worry about right now. Um, Delta hat, or I'm sorry, delta bar also doesn't change if you apply a field automorphism of K. So the effect of one of these field automorphisms of K is that it will permute the finite places of K around. And, uh, and so it will essentially have the effect of just changing these factors around from place to place, but overall it won't change what this group is. And you'll still have this homomorphism of, of delta there and the closure will be the same. Um, so this field automorphism doesn't change the the um, the congruence completion. So what this maybe this provides a little uh, this provides a little motivation for us to sort of collect. If I have a particular representation of a group in the PSL two, I'm going to sort of think that this this representation doesn't change. It's still the same representation if I conjugate that that representation around. It'll also, I'll also still think of it as being the representation if all I did is apply a field automorphism. I sort of take some Galois twist, some Galois automorphism of all of the entries of those matrices. I'll still think of that as the same um, representation as well. Okay, so now I've given all of the definitions I need to to state the theorem. So the idea, uh, the theorem here, again, with uh, joint with Ben McReynolds, 
is that we're going to suppose that gamma, again, finitely generated and residually finite, has n Zariski dense rigid representations in PSL2C up to conjugation and field automorphisms. And then I'm listing them out, F1, F2, dot, 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 Fn. So, um, so again, I'm sort of, if I have two different representations that are conjugate, I'm sort of counting them as just one. If I have one representation and another where I got from, I can get from one to the other by taking uh, a field automorphism and, and sort of changing the matrix entries according that, to that field automorphism, I'm considering that one representation. Uh, and so all of these are distinct up to those two operations. Okay, so gamma has these n different rigid representations. If lambda is a mystery group with the same profinite completion, so again, finitely generated, residually finite, uh, then this mystery, then uh, oh, this should this should not be a bar. So so ignore this this hat. It should say then then gamma. I'm sorry. Then lambda, not lambda hat, also has n reps as above, meaning that there's a risky dense rigid up to conjugation and field automorphisms, and we'll name them G1 to Gn. And if we were to take the congruence completions of the images of each of these representations, so for F1, F1 takes gamma to some subgroup of PSL2C. It's rigid, so we could assume that it has, uh, it has entries in some number field. And so we could take the congruence completion of that representation. So that's what that F1 of gamma bar represents. And we do this for each of the representations of gamma, take the direct product, and we'll get some profinite group. And what we're claiming is that if you were to do that same operation to all those uh, representations of lambda, then you take the direct product of those congruence completions, you get isomorphic profinite groups. So the content here essentially is saying that the profinite completion of gamma remembers the congruence completions of all of its rigid of all of the rep rigid representations of gamma okay so that's a lot of words <laughs> it's in general can be a little strange but there are times when it can be very very useful especially when n is equal to one <laughs> that's that's the best case uh, and the easiest case to work with um oh one thing to to worry about here uh, I'm not saying that this isomorphism of these two groups takes a particular factor isomorphically to any other particular factor. In general, in fact, it can sort of mix up the, the factors over here with parts of the factors over here. Because if you remember, how did we define these congruence completions? Actually, each of these congruence completions is made up of a bunch of different factors, sort of p-adic factors as you're varying p. And so you can have those p-adic factors sort of jumping from place to place under this isomorphism. Um, so yeah, the, the idea, the reason that this theorem, I, I, the reason I want to sell this theorem as being potentially useful is that it can continue, it can help us potentially find new examples of profinitely rigid groups um, as soon as we're able to implement that step one from, from uh, the plan for showing that a group is profinitely rigid, if it's a it's if it's the fundamental group of a finite volume hyperbolic three manifold and it's arithmetic, a couple other conditions. If we're able to get step one to work, then step two sort of follows automatically from from the results of Brideson and Reed. So then that group would be profinitely rigid. So so potentially this opens the door for showing that many other groups are profinitely rigid. Um, and I stated this theorem using PSL two C. But in fact, you can you can also get it to work for any other algebraic group over C, maybe simple and connected uh, for those that are in the know. Uh, all right, quickly, I'll try to just say maybe some of the proof ideas uh, very broadly, uh, what goes involved here uh, before I run out of time. So in general, what the way that we try to prove this is that we work one prime at a time and we try to compare the representations of gamma and gamma hat, the profinite completion, in PSL2 QP bar. So QP bar here is the prof is the algebraic closure of all of the p-adic fields. It sort of functions as a container to hold all of the p-adic representations um, in here, no matter what the field of definition is. A general fact that that is true is that 
the representation of gamma sort of extends to the profinite completion, uh, its image will be profinite and so hence will extend. That happens exactly when the image of, of this representation is bounded in the p-adic metric. So in general, there's sort of this bijection between bounded representations of gamma and continuous representations of gamma hat. And we're sort of trying to connect those. Uh, the next thing is that the p-adic deformations of representations, the so sort of kind of wiggling a representation around and seeing if it's still conjugate, not conjugate anymore, that sort of thing. Those p-adic deformations do pass between the bounded representations of gamma and the representations of gamma hat. And lastly, one can see that uh, being sort of rigid, a representation being rigid in the topology coming from C uh, actually happens if and only if it's rigid in the p-adic topology in QP. So if I have this C rigid representation, I sort of think about it as living inside a p-adic field, whether or not the representation is rigid with these uh, C deformations, C continuous deformations, it happens if and only if it's rigid with respect to the QP deformations. Uh, and that's sort of because this rigidity phenomenon is really more of an algebraic condition rather than a topological condition. Um, so sorry for going a little long there, but thank you for your attention. And I'm looking forward to hearing any questions that you might have.